I just felt like an outsider. I came from a disadvantaged background until my very first day at KPMG. The analogy that I always use is in sport, we talk about 10,000 hours for elite performance. What I learned is that my 10,000 hours started when I was 21. And if I look at my daughter, her 10,000 hours started at the age of four. I think becoming a dad for me changed the way that I looked at young people. I want to work with young people. I want to give them a chance. I think with mentoring and coaching, it clearly works. We've worked with about 450 youngsters. 100% of them tell us that you did exactly what Thank you to Noesh for being here. Um, so, I'm going to start from the beginning. What do we need to know about your life to understand the path you've taken? Tell us about your childhood. Well, look, firstly, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for showing up on a beautiful Tuesday evening. To be honest, Taylor, it was a pretty normal upbringing. I am the son of migrants. I grew up in Newham in, a, in council housing, and on reflection... But at the time, it just felt normal, right? Dad worked at a Ford Motor Company. Mum was a homemaker. I've learned that terminology. And yeah, I had a little sibling and it was pretty normal, you know? Um, yeah, that's it. And um, were there any people in your life that you looked up to for support or inspiration? It's a good question. I think, again, I would say the support and the infrastructure around me was very much a typical Indian upbringing. Lots of family, lots of trips to the local temple and temple-related activities. But would I say there was an individual that I particularly looked up to? If I'm honest, probably not. So, yeah. yeah. You said in, in retrospect it was a disadvantaged upbringing. In what way was that the case? So look, with the work that I do now, which we're going to go on to, I would say disadvantaged because there was no opportunities. What I now know is that the circles you hang in, the people that you have access to, the opportunities that your school can offer you from a young age really, really impact where you end up. Yeah. And when I look back at that, I had probably none of that. You know, we talk a lot about network. My mum and dad didn't have a network, right? When you're spending most of your hours trying to make ends meet and your community is the local temple, the school community, you come from a postcode where basically everybody's trying to make ends meet. Yeah. You know, there is no network and there are no opportunities. And, and, and I, can, I can say that now when I reflect on where I came from. From my research, you ended up working in Canary Wharf and yeah. finance. How did that come about? Okay, so I always wanted to work with children. And I remember I did my year 10 work experience, which was a very long time ago, in a school. But then I ended up doing really well at school. And I, I think what I did, no, I know what I did, is I said to myself, why would I go and be a teacher and earn 20 grand a year when I can go into finance and add at least a zero on the end of that, right? And so, yeah, that's how I got into my career. So as you say, you know, my career has been in finance. I'm a chartered accountant by background. I worked in banking and I currently work for Ernst & Young, but we'll go to that in a moment because I don't actually do any of the traditional work that EY are known for. Okay. Um, what was it like then coming from this disadvantaged background? Um, we often hear the phrase imposter syndrome. Yeah. Did you ever feel that being in yeah. you know, such yeah. highly regarded? So it's, in it's a really interesting question, Taylor. I didn't know that I came from a disadvantaged background mm -hmm. until my very first day at KPMG. So I remember it very, very clearly. I achieved a first at university. I topped the business school. And I remember I was in Birmingham. And I remember walking into work that morning, feeling absolutely on top of the world and ready for the world ahead of me. And literally that first day, and I remember it clearly, it was a Tuesday. That first day systematically broke me down. So let me share a couple of stories with you. I walked in and I was wearing a brown-coloured suit. And this is before brown-coloured suits were fashionable, right? 
And the other 99, because I was an intake of 100 people from university, all the other 99, it felt like they'd been sent an email that you should all wear blues and greys, and I was the only guy in brown. And then, again, we talk about water cooler conversation, right? The guys and girls around me all seem to know what to talk about. And I wanted to talk about football. And again, I felt like an outlier. And that evening, the partners, as they do, took us out for dinner. And I was presented with this set of cutlery in front of me that I had absolutely no idea what to do with. And I remember thinking, how the hell have I gone from first class degree, ready for this, to completely feel utterly inadequate, Mm. right? And what it did is very, very, very quickly planted a seed in my mind that I just, I just hadn't been prepared yeah. for the world that I was now in. And the time was also quite different, right? So I remember people would make comments like, can we change your name to something that we find a little bit easier to pronounce? And I used to think, well, you can say supercalifragilistic, but what, you can't say Nilesh, you know? And yeah, I just, I just felt like an outsider. And the analogy that I've often used more recently is my, my wife's in the room, which brings an added pressure. <laughs> um, and you know, we, we have a young daughter and I look at her and I think to myself, the analogy that I always use is in sport, we talk about 10,000 hours for elite performance. What I learned is that my 10,000 hours started when I was 21. And if I look at my daughter, her 10,000 hours started at the age of four, three, even earlier, right? And that's what, and look, it's no one's fault, right? It's, that's just the way it is. And that was the disadvantage, literally, that I was fighting against. Yeah. So you're having these experiences and yeah. you're not fitting in the way that you imagined you would. Yeah. Um, you went on to start a social enterprise. How, mm. did, how did that come about based on... Okay, so this isn't a short answer. Mm -hmm. Um, So look, I pushed those thoughts aside, right? And I said to myself, Nilesh, and again, this is a very Indian trait and the Indians in the room will will definitely relate to this. You kind of get told, be grateful, show loyalty, be happy that you've got a job. And this job might just be the thing that changes the path for you and your family and all future generations to kind of suck it up. So I stayed in banking and finance for a number of years. You know, I was part of the Santander team that devised the one, two, three strategy. Um, I worked for Lloyd's Banking Group. I joined EY in 2014. But all the time, and again, no one else's fault per se, but I always felt like I was pushing to fit in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a few things happened. I think the first one is in 2013, I became a dad. And particularly for the parents in the room, I think becoming a dad for me changed the way that I looked at young people. The bit, sorry, that I didn't mention is what I said to myself was, Nilesh, get to the top, Mm -hmm. go and become CEO, go and become MD, make some money, and then you can go and pursue what it is that you love in a more full-time way. Because on the side, I always worked in the community. Yeah. Um, so, so what is the social enterprise? What Can is you the explain, social? Yeah, to yeah. us. Yeah. Well, you actually so, do. So the se- let me just finish. The first reason was becoming a dad. Mm-hmm. The second one is I was born with a very rare neurodegenerative condition, which has no medicine or cure. And actually, for the first 30 years of my life, I've been pretty unaffected. But in my 30s, I definitely felt its impact so it's a, it's, an, it's a condition that affects your nervous system and leads to muscle wasting. And in my mid-30s, I think, if I'm totally honest, I, I hid it from home for a long time. But I was fighting the tiredness, the discomfort, the pain. And I'd been to see my doctor and she said, Nilesh, if your degeneration continues, this might not, this will affect your mobility in the future. And so what that did is it just accelerated my desire to work with young people. And then the final piece of the jigsaw is that in 2016, I went back to my old secondary school to do an assembly called, if I can do it, you can do it too. And my message to the young people that I was presenting to was very simple. I came to this school and I've done okay. Why can't you? And a black boy followed me out of that assembly and asked me to mentor him. And 
I said to him, yeah, of course, dude, I'll mentor you. Go and enjoy the summer holiday after the school holidays. And he said to me, am I allowed to come to Canary Wharf? And I said to him, well, why wouldn't you be allowed to come to Canary Wharf? And he said, well, oh, okay. I thought all black people in Canary Wharf were either cleaners or security guards. And I got quite emotional because I was stood in this playground that I'd stood in exactly 20 years ago. I was a dad. I looked at this boy who was supposed to have this young chutzpah of, hey man, I'm going to change the world on my own, right? And you kind of go, wait till you get a bit older and life will knock that out of you. But instead, he thought, am I allowed to come to Canary Wharf? So anyway, he went away in the summer. He came back with a bunch of his friends. I worked with them pretty much on my own. There were five, six young people and me. At the end of that year, at the end of that academic year, that black boy got into EY to become a chartered accountant. And he literally just qualified in the December gong. And the other five, four of them went to university and one started an apprenticeship. And I met Joshua's mum in Starbucks in Stratford in 2017. And I had this Nigerian lady holding my hands. She was crying. I was crying. And she said, Nilesh, I think you've changed our lives. And at the time, I didn't realize that that moment was about to change mine, right? So usually the next part of the story, I tell however I want, but I'm not going to get away with that today because she's in the room. I said to Hamel, I said, look, this is the thing that I've been searching for, right? I want to work with young people. I want to give them a chance. I think with mentoring and coaching, it clearly works. And I went part time. So I took a 40% pay cut at the back end of 2017 because I wanted time, right? And a, a lot of the busy professionals in the room will realize that we're okay financially, but it's time that, that that's where we're poor, right? So I'm super grateful that I had the support of Hemel. And that's it. That's where the social enterprise started. Um, yeah. How did, how, what was the response from your family, from your partner? Was it supportive straight off the bat? I, I got a feeling this is a loaded question. <laughs> she was absolutely amazing. Um, if I'm honest, there was probably a part of Hemel that thought, what's this guy doing? <laughs> right? How have, because when I met Hemel, you know, I wanted to be a partner. You know, I wanted to be a CEO. And all of a sudden, there's this dude going, I'm taking a pay cut, okay, to do what? To work in the community. What are you going to do? Mm, don't know, but I'll build something. And it just, it's just grown and grown and grown, right? Um, and in the beginning, I think a lot of the hang-ups were me, right? Because when you work in finance, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest and admit that there was that male bravado in me. You know, one day I'm going to drive a Lambo. I'm going to have tailored suits. Now, all of a sudden, I've got to say to my mates, I want to work in the community, right? So a lot of those hang-ups were me. But yeah, I've had nothing but support, goodwill, um, I mean, I know I'm fast forwarding a bit, but the number of, I mean, recently at, at, um, at Christmas when we were doing our hot meals program, which I'll touch on in a moment, one of our youngsters said, you know, my family have just been at Mecca. I wanted you to know that my grandparents have been praying for you, right? So I know that I'm lucky that I have both the support, some of the team are here who give hours and hours and hours. So I have loads of direct support, but also I know that I have people's prayers and blessings and goodwill and all of that counts. Yeah. If you're enjoying this show, then chances are you'll like my podcast too. It's called Strategy and Tragedy. And as the name suggests, is all about sharing both the highs and lows of business because entrepreneurship, even for the most level-headed among us, is a roller coaster. Focused on sharing both interesting stories and important lessons learned by other entrepreneurs. Guests include the likes of Nick Telson Sillip, the co-founder of Design My Night, which he sold for $30 million. Charlotte Morley of The Little Loop, who made history on BBC's Dragon's Den, Heinen Zhang of Why Hungry, a Y Combinator startup, Tom Adeyula, the exited founder of Meetail, Nina Mahanti of Blue Money, and so many more inspirational leaders. Tune in now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Amazon Music, or YouTube. Um, could you explain a little bit more about the Hot Meals program? Yeah, so why don't I tell you very quickly what I Can You Can Too does. So I Can You Can Too started as a coaching and mentoring program, right? What we said is we said, we think, actually we know that there's three things that young people don't get that we want to give them, 
One is access to role models. And we very intentionally use the word real role models. So we want to put people around them that look like them, come from where they've come from, but then have gone on to become CEOs and partners and surgeons and architects and really demystify and break down those barriers. So that's one access. The second one is a bit like what Joshua said, am I allowed to come to Canary Wharf? We've got youngsters who believe that they're not allowed to stand on the 40th floor at HSBC, for example, in Canary Wharf. And what we've used the analogy often is that if, any, if you can buy the ticket to Madame Tussauds, you can go. But actually, unless someone invites you into Linklaters or Sky or Pinson Masons or EY, you can't just walk in. So we do all of our sessions inside the buildings of these wonderful corporates. And then the third one is to teach them what we know they will need to get into these companies. But sadly, they're not taught at school. How do you write a CV? What's personal brand? How do I write a presentation? And to date, we've worked with about 450 youngsters. 100% yeah. of them tell us that you did exactly what you said you'd do. And we've got youngsters, in fact, some of them are in the room at PwC, at LSE, at why is it gone? Julius Bear. And they're doing it, right? And what we've learned is that with time and by giving, by giving them your commitment, they can go on to do whatever, whatever it is that they want to. So that's our first and what I would say is our bread and butter. During COVID, a little four-year-old boy died of malnutrition. And what that taught us, and that was one of the reasons that I wanted to go part-time, right? I didn't want to be the guy that sat in an ivory tower that wanted to build solutions based on what I thought they needed. We are out there in the community with the families, with the youngsters, and we've seen, we've heard, we've felt what they need. So that, in fact, Sheena's in the room. You know, we had a text exchange about, at the time, Marcus Rashford was talking a lot about end food poverty. And we were like, hey man, why don't we do something about this? And so at the time, it started with 100 women and children locally, getting food surpluses from M&S and Sainsbury's and whatever and getting them out into the families. We've just finished Easter, which was about 350 women and children, breakfast, lunch and dinner, throughout the two-week holiday, Easter eggs. And it's become a real, we wish that we didn't have to do it, but we're proud of what we do. Yeah. And then the third component of I Can, You Can Too is a little bit of this, right? Which is what we call storytelling. Like we straddle this quite unique place where we are in the grassroots, but we also get to come to wonderful venues and hang out with super sick professionals and people like yourselves. And we storytell. Mm. And what that does is it allows us to connect the community with the corporates. So that's mm. I Can, You Can Too. Wonderful. What does a like, typical journey of a student that's <laughs> involved in the mentorship program look like? So... We work with year 12 students. Mm -hmm. So what we learned is over the years, we found that year 12 is the sweet spot. So they start with us at the beginning of the academic, in fact, a couple of the, a few of the year 12s are here. They start with us at the beginning of the academic year. And we have a syllabus that's kind of tried and tested that we've developed over the last seven years. And we deploy that syllabus, which is a mixture of expert coaching and giving them the chance to practice the skills. And then over the years, we've been able to build that into a deeper provision for them. So getting them work experience, bringing them to events like this so that they can normalize this, yeah. giving them the opportunities to be able to go and do voluntary work so that they can add to their CVs. So that's what the typical journey looks like for a year 12 student. And they're with us for the whole year. Do you have any success stories you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, look, they're in the room, right? <laughs> nice. um, you know, they're in the room, if, and not to embarrass any one of them, but, you know, he's picked the front row, so I should pick on him. But, you know, Anmol, I would say, is a young person with a colourful past. And to think that this young man now is the highest performing apprentice at Julius Bear is just incredible, right? Um, and... You know, we're proud of these young people. What we're proud of is not only do they become fantastic professionals, but the number of hours that they then give to things like our Hot Meals program in paying it forward. So, yeah, I mean, look, there's success stories all over the room, right? And we're proud of each and every one of them. It must feel pretty good for you as well to, like, see how much it's evolved. 
Yeah, absolutely. But look, I am, I'm really keen to make this point, actually. I think we live in a time where there's this real cult of the individual. Mm. Like there's this one guy or girl that's the superstar. Genuinely, I'm not a superstar, right? If I think about if I hadn't had the support of Hemel on day one, if I hadn't had people like Sheena and David who are also here that give their evenings and weekend for us, I'm proud of what we are doing and I'm proud of breaking the narrative that people are selfish, people are interested in it for themselves. Like if I think about the fact that we have four, 500 professionals that work with us across a year, we're talking Olympians, we're talking FTSE 100 board members, we're talking surgeons and judges and entrepreneurs, right? It's a real genuine team effort. And yeah, the team effort is the bit that I'm most proud of. Yeah. How is it getting everyone on board in the beginning? Tough. You know, like partnering with schools and finding mentors. To... Yeah, look, I'm not going to lie. It's the same with any startup, yeah. right? Um, it was tough because what people I think are looking for is results. They're looking for credibility. They're looking for, unless you sound like a good guy with noble intentions, but can you give me some examples? And in the beginning, you can't, right? Because that's just the nature of it. Yeah. But... I'm, I'm, look, people took a punt on me. Things happened early on in the journey that I know have benefited me in getting to where we are today. Like the spiritual part of me goes, when I look back, isn't it great that all six youngsters in my very first year ended up doing wonderful things? Early on in the journey, Forbes magazine profiled I Can, You Can Too globally. Wow. And that helped me open doors. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, it was a little bit tough, but I'm glad we stuck at it. Brilliant people, as I say, have joined and we've got credibility now. Yeah. now we've got results now. So um, yeah, and I'm proud of what we do. Yeah. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in the beginning, do you think? Look, I think the biggest challenge is always in your own head, right? Yeah. Where you're going, what am I actually doing? And can I actually make this work? And how do I look at my wife? How do I look at my daughter and go, I know that, we, I, I know that I've taken on the role of providing for you guys and I, I take pride in looking after you guys, but what if this doesn't work out? But look, you know, I'm, I'm also grateful to EY, right? So I said I'd, I'd bring them up. They've been brilliant with me, right? So I went part-time and last year they asked me to come back full-time. So I now work full-time for EY. I get told this all the time. I'm probably the only guy on the planet at EY that gets paid full time to run his own company. Um, but yeah, look, I think I'm looking outside. I'm looking at the universe and I feel blessed and I feel lucky that people and things have conspired to help me. Yeah. What's well, been the most rewarding part of the whole experience? The fact that I can genuinely say that I'm doing the one thing that I care the most about. Yeah. Right? Let me, let me share a couple of stories, right? I think... When you have a condition that causes you discomfort, pain on a daily basis, you're reminded of your fallibility, your mortality, just how normal and how human you are. And that's something that I've grappled with all my life, right? Like I remember on my 40th birthday saying to Hemel, this wasn't the most cheery thought, but I remember saying to her as I turned 40 that statistically I'm now closer to death at 80 than I am to being born. Yeah. So I've always been fascinated by my time here and making it count. And I can honestly say hand on heart that I get to live my life in the way that I want to, yeah. um, doing what I believe in. Um, and that's pretty cool, you know. If you could go back to your childhood and chat to yourself as a kid, what would you say, do you think? Do you know what? It's a good question. I'd say let it play out. Every one of those experiences, like I say this to our youngsters, right? Growing up in the way our young people grow up is difficult, mm -hmm. right? You know, when you have, I'll give an example of one of our youngsters. She has to wake up every morning because mum is at work and make, do breakfast for her three siblings. She then walks them to school and then goes to school herself. After school, she picks them up, does their tea, does their homework, puts them to bed and then she does her homework, right? And what I say to her all the time is I know it's tough, but you have no idea that the resilience, the inner strength, the well within you that is building is the well that was building inside me. 
Yeah. Right? So I'd say to my younger self, it's, it's the classic question, right? And I'd say, let it play out, right? And embrace all of it. Do you think that's what you've done? Yeah, I've just rolled with it, right? Rolled with it, believed in myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you hope to achieve in the next five years? What's the future of I Can You Can Too? I think it's a, look, it's a good question and I'm a finance guy mm. and I get one year, three year, five year projections. I get it, right? But we've never had those projections. What we've had is that the young people that come our way, and we obviously work now with a lot more youngsters and we do more for our youngsters. I just, I just hope that we can, uh, we will continue to do that and whatever happens in the next five years will play out and we will use our, we will use our usual decision metrics is it right for the youngsters first and foremost? Are these the things that I would put? So my daughter, our daughter is called Mahi. Would, would I put Mahi in this situation? Yes or no? And to some people, that sounds cheesy. It's my truth, man. That's how we've always made decisions. Is it right for the youngsters? And it's got us this far. And I have absolutely every conviction that it will get us to five years, 10 years and four. Right? If there's one thing that I've learned about youngsters is actually... They don't care whether you're white, black, brown, pink or blue. They genuinely don't care whether you're male, female or another variation, whether you're able-bodied, whatever, right? They don't care. What they want is to know that you care and that you will do what you say you will do, right? And actually, there's no formula. Um, I don't think we've done any more than that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't advocate to anybody to give up their job. But what I would advocate... And please forgive me, I don't mean to sound preachy, is that you start, right? And start from wherever you stand um, with whatever you have and um, do the thing that lights you up, right? For me, working with young people is the one thing that lights me up, right? Um, I'll often come home and I'll share a story and Hemel will say, and you can see on my face, you can tell in my voice, that's the one thing that I love. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, should we have some questions from the audience? If anyone has anything they would like to ask. Mm -hmm. Yes. Front row. <laughs> have you become more self-aware in helping others? Will you expand on that? So, Thomas, good to see you again. Um, we met at York University a number of years ago. Thomas, will you expand on that question, please? What do you mean by that? So, my key notion I saw us off in the finance industry of yeah. going and start my venture. I do find that when you go out from the corporate road, very structured, very hierarchical, very set direction, mm. you do tend to get caught up, not just from a life balance perspective, but from a mental perspective. My question to you is when you pause, reflected on what's important to you and your real mission, very purpose-driven mission, has that made you realise speaking on to individuals who you see great value in and you see them go on to achieve things that they set out to achieve? Do you find yourself becoming more self-aware of what it is you actually want and who it is you are and what it is you want out of life? Yeah, look, man, it's a great question, and I'm glad I asked you for more details. So let me open up, right? When I had the period of my health not being in a great place, I also suffered from depression, and I sought counselling, therapy. And actually what I realised is it was a period for me to really work out who I was and what I really wanted. So the analogy that I've often used, because I love Lego, is what I'd done is I'd built this Lego tower, and that was Nilesh. But what I'd done is I'd picked up bricks that my dad wanted me to be, society, lots of bricks that society wanted me to be. And ultimately, man, it broke me, right? I ended up living a life that just didn't resonate with me. It wasn't my dream anymore, right? And I had to do the hard work to have all these bricks in front of me, if I can continue the metaphor, and pick up the ones that I felt were me, right? And really build a version of me that could serve, right? So I'll come home often and I'll say, this happened, but I said sorry. And I'll say sorry because I know that it's for the greater good. Or sometimes someone will be rude to you. Or in the beginning of my journey, people would close the door on you and go, look, man, you're a good guy, but we don't really know what you're talking about and what you want to do. But you had to swallow your ego and your pride and keep trying, right? And so, yeah, that journey has made me more self-aware of who I am and the way I operate. Does that answer your question, Thomas? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, did you have a question? I said it was about the sort of, I mean, I've I've read and listened to a call I fired off in this book, um, and the, uh, some of the some of the stories he talks about resonate. You know, with what you're saying, but yeah, you seem to leave your mind in fairness and talking <laughs> with people away just to. I'm not, not I've been through a similar journey when I, you know, to where a playing white show or a live boot show. Uh, you know, you don't have, yeah. you just probably know your fault. But um, and how do you get those messages across in, in a right way and not have that bitterness maybe that, that's um, about the inequality in fact. So what's your name? Chris. Chris. Um, Chris, I just, I just think it is the way it is, right? And, and, I, and I use the example of my daughter, right? She, I see my daughter talking, like when we run our Hot Meals programme, like I'll see her working with a lawyer or, you know, we joked because she was working with a CEO at Easter and we look at her and we go, that's just the way her life's played out. And me not knowing was just the way my life played out. Right. Um, and what we've sought to do is to try and guide and talk to our youngsters about not changing who they are. But I suppose the, 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 the term for it at the moment is code switching. How do you how do you respect and embrace another environment and what do you need to do to equip yourself to do that? Um, but no, for me, there's no bitterness, right? It's, this is what it is and what can I do about it and what can we do about it, right? Um, and yeah, that, that's all it's been, Chris. Thanks, Shay. Thank you, that's a very nice, very precious. Thank you. Um, my question is the mix of last answer about the code switching. So... If you feel that on an level to young people, the mindset is chain at an early rate. Yeah. How much of that is down to the current educational system? And what is it needs to change on a government or institutional level? Actually, look, the truth is that the op- there's a poverty of opportunity, right? So if I go to one of my schools in Newham, or I go to one of the schools in Barking and Dagenham, the difference is that the guys just don't get the opportunities, right? For whatever reason, as an example, the government decided to... Some of the schools in these neighbourhoods, not sorry, the government, decided to get rid of work experience, right? Because they, they decided that they didn't want to spend money on that activity. So for a lot of these youngsters are walking into buildings for the first time at the age of 19, right? What we need to do is get them for it to be familiar, right? And there needs to be more intervention in how do you... And, and actually, it's a great time because companies, there really feels like the zeitgeist is changing where companies are really embracing this. So the companies want young people and fresh talent. And there's a dearth of opportunity in certain communities. Why don't we get compu- companies and schools working together to open those doors and giving the kids access. I don't want to talk too much about the government. Do I think the government will do it? I'm not so sure. Do I think corporates can do it? Yes. Like we were lucky, right? We were doing some stats last week. We've worked with 43 different companies this academic year. So companies really want to do this stuff, right? Um, and the young people in the room will laugh. At the moment, every week, we're putting out an inside day for them, right? So for me, I'm not an expert on what the government is, is and can, can't do. But I can definitely see we can get young people into organizations via the corporate route because they definitely want to open their doors. Did you have a question? I'm Chris as well. Hi, Chris. Not my brother, by the way. Very inspiring chat. And I'm... Um, Really, you sort of well, your path to reach you where you are now, and you're um, listening to what your experience has been. But um, these two questions, I'll start with the first one. We come from a background where cultural habits, ideas, influence what our children and others do. I'm sure you faced it yourself. 100%. And here I'm you now now listening to you say, I took a group of individuals and took them into violence. When I'll bet anybody did that. The, the parents that wanted them to be lawyers, mm. um, doctors, yep. surgeons, astronauts, etc. How did you overcome that challenge, that cultural challenge between parents aspiring to see their children, even their week back there, to what you were aspiring to achieve with them? Chris, I think it's a lot of it. This is to do with relationships, right? We, it's funny actually. We've got a young person on our program who. His parents wanted him to be a dentist. And actually, through 
we call them immersive experiences. So by putting them in a private bank, by putting them in a law firm, et cetera, et cetera, Akansh realized that actually he wanted to go into tech. But because we have a relationship with the young person, because we speak to the parents, because the parents can see these guys aren't flash in the pan, they don't do one session and then disappear. Actually, when you can speak to the parents and say, look, yes, we understand. Like my mom and dad wanted me to be an optician. It's quite funny, I actually married an optician, but my mom and dad wanted me to be an optician and I went into finance, right? And a lot of it is about education. Like my mom and dad, in their mind, optometry was going to be the thing that would give their son a comfortable life, right? But it was about educating them. And it's the same with a lot of the parents of our young people. It's educating them. And when you make yourself accessible and you talk to them and you openly invite them to things where they can come and have a conversation, that's made things a lot easier, Chris. And that's one of the reasons we've guarded the numbers on our programs. People always say to me, well, why don't you have intakes of 500 youngsters? Well, if you had 500 youngsters, we won't, I won't know their names. The team won't know their names. We won't have the relationship with them, right? I understand that numbers are sexy, but actually we're in the business of changing lives. And actually, if the numbers aren't quite as big as people would like them to be, we're okay with that. So relationships with the young people and their parents and the community is super important. The, the second part of the question was, let's move away from the cultural pressures. Uh, let's go to the corporate ones. Yeah. I mean, when you are a senior manager, you're expected to deliver yeah. and deliver results rather quickly. Yeah. If you're distracted by focusing to try and nurture and develop a, yeah. a progress, the minority, they say, yeah. um, somehow you run the risk of you being put in the firing line. Yeah. How do you overcome those challenges? Especially career growth as well. Honestly, Chris, this is the question that I genuinely wish that I had a scientific answer for, but I don't, right? And sometimes I look at myself and it's almost like I'm this village idiot that was like, I want to do this thing. I don't have a plan, but I'm doing it, right? And I've often said this to Hemel, right? That for a long time, I've carried a pressure of what if I am in the firing line, right? But the conviction that I've... Like, I can only talk about me, right? I've... Look, you can call it luck. You can call it blessings. You can call it whatever you want, right? My journey has been that I went part-time in 2017, and now in 2023, I, I was asked last year to come back to full time to run my own company, right? I don't know how I did that, but that's the way my journey's played out, right? Um, has, it, has it had pressures? Of course it has, right? But thankfully, I don't need to answer what happens if you're in the firing, you know, you're in the line of fire because it didn't, that's not what happened for me. It seems to be rich, at least I'm taking my hat out to you and I really applaud you for what you've achieved. Um, but there's only one ruling, one Marcus Rashford, one um, uh, the guy, Tesla guy. I mean, these are very unique individuals. But I think the youngest that we've appreciated, we're not all going to become me number ones, but becoming one minus a little bit is equally as good. Yeah. And with those challenges need a lot of motivation, a lot of encouragement. Yeah. If you look at the value of the corporate world, though, yeah. it's it's a minefield and it's a word is so very difficult and as I said I started by congratulations and I want to finish by saying well done really thank you so much we've got to give you the strength to continue so that's our road yeah well done thank you